I'm on my way over to view an office building. It's quite a nice looking thing, grade two listed again in a, in a town locally. Um, capital values here are slightly higher than they are in other towns around here. So um, GDV will be higher because it's grade two listed. The development will be a little bit more expensive. Uh, we're sort of niching into the grade two listed heritage building niche by the look of it and I mean I, don't, I haven't necessarily gone out my way to make that happen but I think it's because I like historic stuff and and uh, bringing, bringing things back to life some of these buildings these old grade 2 listed stuff that you know they've been left to rot and it's doing the towns no service whatsoever to just leave them there and because the office market is so flat uh, particularly COVID just sort of put the nail in that coffin because it's so flat um, the only thing that you can really do with these things is turn them into residential stuff studios, HMOs, apartments unless you do something really creative like well I don't know really leisure facility or something modern world maybe podcasting and, and other creative arty type stuff there's nothing else you can do with them really so the councils and the planners need to be on board with developers to, to you know get these things through a lot quicker 4,000 square feet just shy of that where we're going now so off the top of my head if we went through with a studio type model We'd be looking at around, with the size that we like to do, probably 13 or 14 units. Um, apartments, we'd probably be looking at eight or nine one-bed apartments. If we're going to put a couple of two-beds in there, we'll probably be down at six or seven. So, yeah, that's where I'm heading at the moment. Always keeping in mind long-term vision and short-term goals, two separate things. Things that need to be done, the ugly stuff that no one really talks about to hit the short-term goals. So uh, as an, like KPIs, so for an example, if I, um, you know, I wanna put another 200,000 pound a year rent roll, I know that I need to be offering on X amount of property that's already cash flowing X amount of money um, and if I don't do that, then that, those goals aren't going to be hit. So your small daily habits, your weekly habits, your monthly habits need to sit underneath the goals and the goals sit underneath the overarching vision. And generally speaking, your vision will come from your values. So looking at this one, if, if we do buy it and we do turn it into apartments, we'll probably refinance it, keep hold of them rent them out it's a good area good values good capital values the uplifting value will be good um, we'll probably make more money if we did sell them but in the long term long term vision again long term it'll be better to keep hold of them I've noticed some of the stuff that I sold in the past I regret selling uh, so I you know I do trade a lot but the, the nice stock the stuff that would be cash flowing well now the stuff that I'd already pulled out all my money through refinancing shouldn't have really sold those things um, in hindsight but you live and learn um, the residential the residential stock that I buy and sell quickly I have no worries about that I mean I'm, that's a big part of my business but the commercial stuff I like to keep hold of with good tenants um, the bigger HMO stuff I don't mind keeping, particularly if it's, if it's leased to social housing type providers, so that's fairly hands-off in a commercial agreement anyway. Um, yeah, long-term visions, short-term goals, daily habits. So I went to see the office bot this morning. Um, we're not going to go for that, I don't think. There's a few things out the back that we're concerned about, structural problems. It's going to cost too much to make it worthwhile doing the deal and the layout wasn't what we thought it was the floor plans aren't that great still nice building and if we can get it for cheap enough we'll buy it we'll still put an offer in 
They're asking for three to five. It was originally up for nearly four. We'll go in there about 200 grand, something like that, really low. And if that gets accepted, um, I mean, very unlikely, but we'll do that deal at two. It's worthwhile then. Uh, but not expecting to buy it. And when, uh, when I come away, we had a conversation in the cafe. We grabbed a coffee and um, we were talking about the first deal that we had done, uh, the, the guy I was with, his first deal was a, a local deal, he paid 85 grand for it, he sold it for 120 about five years ago, he bought it about nine years ago. And my first deal was, I paid 65 grand, I spent about seven grand on it and I sold that two years ago um, so I bought that back in 2013, so I paid 65 grand back in 2013. I spent about seven grand on it. I rented it out all that time, remortgaged it a couple of times. Um, and I sold it for 100 grand about two years ago. And I look back now and I wonder, would it, be, would it have been better off keeping it, you know, just for like sentimental reasons and whatever, but it had a flat roof and it was horrible little thing. I'll try and find a picture of it. Um, and I look back at, at the linear progression and the sort of levels of development. And it's quite predictable that people start smaller and they grow bigger, but it doesn't need to be that way. You know, that sort of, happens when um, you don't surround yourself with people who grow exponentially bigger and quicker than you do. You can network with people who drag you up to their level, you know, birds of a feather flock together. As the tide rises, you know, you rise with it. Um, so that's why I'm such a big proponent of networking with the right people, being around the right people, financers, joint venture partners, deal makers but what's also important is not comparing yourself to other people and the reason being there's always going to be somebody better however you define that better than you and there's always going to be somebody so-called worse than you in whatever you're going to achieve so competition with other people is never ending, it's a road to nowhere. But if you compare yourself to who you were yesterday, who you were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that's when you position yourself in, in sort of a positive state because most of the time, you're gonna be further ahead, even if that's maybe not materially, it might be mentally or spiritually or whatever, you, you know, however, you, however you're looking at it. Always look at you yesterday and compete with you moving forward. What would your future self do in this situation right now? So in essence, your future is dictating your present and your present is dictating your future. See, a lot of people, they look at their pasts and they're so ingrained in it that it affects their present moment they don't know how to live today because of what's happened in the past but the reality is it's how you contextualize the past today that actually writes that past so it's it's a perception it's a worldview and competition competition with you and how you contextualize your past how you as an example in my situation, how I had handled certain business situations, back then I wouldn't do today because I've grown and expanded today. And it's more of a, you have sympathy for yourself and go, oh, okay, I learned a lot of lessons from that. Rather than beating yourself up, you're better today than you were then. And in the future, your big vision, the goals that you're setting for yourself, can you act as that person would act today in order to get there?